Thank you. Nine weeks ago, Nathan and Cody had a bad day Oh, in Tobago. Kelly and Lavon couldn't give a truck in Bogota. Jerry and Frank were chopped in Manaus. Michelle and Vic got lost in Paris. Leo and Alana got speared in Almaty. Caitlin and Haley found out the tooth in Hyderabad. Varna and Ishwar slid out the race in Siem Reap. And Gary and D'Angelo couldn't make music in Manila. Welcome to the final episode of Yachting Number, the Amazing Race 32 recaps from Reality TV Warriors. My name is Michael Harmstone, and joining me as always is a Canadian who describes podcasting with me pretty much every week this year as being the sensation of a really tall roller coaster that he regrets going on, Logan Saunders. Good afternoon. Shit, that was a long sentence I that shouldn't have written for myself. <laughs> and celebrating her 100th episode today is the lady who always teaches her children their life lesson of more chewing, less talking, Michelle Pierce Denovan. <laughs> well, yes, you have to eat and stop talking, correct? I remember when we were talking about the early bit of this season, you going, oh, please, can we make sure we do enough episodes so I reach 100 this year? We just about scraped in there. It is Michelle's 100th episode ever with us today. Well, in this COVID year of not much happiness, it's happy. Yay! And after 11 likes and 33,000 miles, we have our winners. James and Will, are you pleased? I am very pleased for a super fan to finally get there. Yes. What about Brooke and Scott? <laughs> well, yeah, they were good too. but yeah. They were as big super fans as James and Will. Mm. And people seem to be forgetting about that. Well, no, I've just got lots of personal friends with in common with James. So, you know, he was an auger and stuff. So there's another connection there for me. Are you happy, Logan? Yeah, they had a awesome game plan. Maybe people didn't really like watching the game plan play out, but they executed it and they got the they got the W. I think it's really interesting that this episode, despite all its faults, obviously it was a bit linear, but most finales are. I can't begrudge them as much as I normally do with that. This was probably the most traditionally edited episode of the season. It actually felt like a normal Amazing Race episode rather than one of 12 vignettes where nobody's talking to each other in the editing suite. Well, I'm glad you're happy. I didn't say happy. I said it was oh. better edited than normal. <laughs> that is a very low bar. <laughs> well, I'm taking that as you are happy instead of ready to rile up something that's going, getting on your nerves. I am very happy James and Will won based on this episode, because they came across a lot better when there was no alliance bullshit surrounding them. Yeah, when you don't have the when you don't have the alliance halo, it works out a lot better. Yeah, it's pretty much what I've been saying all season, in that these teams are much better out of context of the alliance. When the alliance stuff gets put in there, it's a lot messier. But when you just drag them out of the alliance, these teams are actually really fun. It's a shame about the production of the rest of the season. Speaking of things getting messier, did you see the bonus footage where D'Angelo confronts Riley and Madison at the finish line? I did not, because in the UK we can't watch any of the bonus footage unless some nice person puts it up with a mirror on their Reddit. So, uh, this was a big this big discussion online, but at the finish line, Phil reveals their tight three alliance, and then D'Angelo says, I want to ask the other two teams, how does it feel to lose? <laughs> <laughs> and then essentially... <laughs> I mean, I know on the podcast, I guess Rowling Madison avoided a lot of Gary and D'Angelo's questions, but almost the same thing happened here where Hung and Chin Rowling Madison said, uh, yes, we're happy to, we're essentially happy to lose, we're happy to lose to James and Will. I just, I, I love D'Angelo way more as a salty, bitter X racer than I did on the season. He was so bitter during the finale. And then Riley Madison goes a, go a step further where after that conversation, Riley Madison yes, said, yeah, it was gr great to be in an alliance where nobody backstabbed each other. What affirmed our alliance was after Gary and D'Angelo stole the Berlin leg win away from Hung and Chi. Have you seen D'Angelo's tweets in the past few days? They've just been delicious. We have not had no. anyone as salty post-race ever, I don't think. He was basically live-tweeting watching the finale. And he was so bitchy. It's just what, brilliant. What was he saying? What was one of the things that he said? Um, I've watched the season finale of At Amazing Race CBS twice and the challenges were subpar and very entertaining at best, but couldn't tell if I felt this way because I got eliminated or because it was actually trash. Yeah. Oh. 
<laughs> nice. He's so salty, it's brilliant. <laughs> oh, God. And talking of people being salty, YouTube did not like our banner last week. I had much trouble getting that hung banner through YouTube. Why? Because apparently someone kept reporting it as looking like Hung was performing fellatio on the uh, on the Manila Cop, rather than her doing her best Velociraptor impression, which is what it actually was. Oh my god, I have to go back and look at it. I don't recall feeling she was doing that at all. I actually had to go back and get a new banner just for YouTube so that it would stop trying to copyright my account. That's so weird. So previously, 11 teams raced from the Hollywood Bowl around the world. Riley Madison, James and Will and Hunger Chief formed an alliance. There were allegedly surprising twists, or actually one new twist, and other teams fell by the wayside. Nathan and Cody, Kelly and LeVon, Jerry and Frank and Michelle and Vic were eliminated before the alliance made, quote-unquote, game-changing moves to knock out their competition. Leo and Alana, Kaylin and Haley, and Aparna and Ishwa, all of whom were not taken out by any twist whatsoever, before banding together to take out their biggest competition in Gary and D'Angelo. And, according to Phil, for the first time ever, an alliance of three made it to the final leg together. And I have to ask, Mr. Saunders, is that true? Um, well, in season one, I believe Rob and Brennan, Joel and Bill and Frank and Margarita had a day one alliance. Sure, it didn't stick to stay together, but they did make the final three together. Yeah, I feel like that happened as well in 2001. <laughs> but did they actually work together through the entire race? Well, I mean, they occasionally work together, but they weren't a tight three-team alliance that did every single task together. But all Phil said was, "This, it was the first time a three-team alliance made it to the end. It's like, well, no. <laughs> Phil's exact word here was, for the first time ever, an alliance of three made it to the final leg together. Which, unsurprisingly, given how unreliable narrators, production, and editors have been both this season and the past few seasons, is nonsense. Doesn't matter what his intention was, it's what he says that is the important thing. They don't really go for precision or accurate accuracy when they recite a lot of these facts over the past two seasons. No, and the fun thing is, it coincides with me becoming really pedantic, so I spot all of these things straight away and go, uh, no, there is a brilliant one coming very soon that I don't think either of you will have spotted. Because it's it's really weird. So, teams must now fly to New Orleans, Louisiana, USA. Weirdly worded. Once there, they have to find Louis Armstrong Park, where they'll find their next clue. And Phil dances with the locals on Bourbon Streets. And it is Riley and Madison leaving at 5.58am, James and Will at 6.01, and Hung and Chi at 6.03. Which means that for the first time in a long while, we can actually confirm the pit stop length. Because Riley and Madison checked in at 3.58pm which means that this pit stop was somewhere in the region of about 14 hours. Mm. And Riley and Madison say they started the race a little shaky, but are peaking right now. And Riley even says that they've won the last three legs all on their own. Really? Oh dear. I'm not sure that is true. <laughs> I don't think Riley and Madison would have won that last leg if they'd not been told by James and Will and Hung and Chi what they actually had to do. I think it would have been a foot race between James and Will and Hung and Chi. And I think James and Will probably would have won the last leg because they were two minutes faster than Hung and Chi. And James and Will say that their foundations have strengthened. And Hung says that the race refreshed in her mind why she and Chi got together. They are complete opposites, but a perfect match. Hmm. And now I have to mention something that I know Michelle's going to go, really, that doesn't matter at all. But... Oh gosh, here we go, here we go! Did you notice anything hinky about the flights? No. Hogan? Mm, I know they're on Philippines Airlines. But were they? Because actually the <laughs> only screen we saw was one for Delta. It's actually weirdly cuts between Manila and LAX repeatedly in this scene. Because we see on the flight number screen uh, DL2297, which was the flight I'm led to believe they took from LAX to New Orleans, and as a result of that, we saw James and Will going across the sky bridge at LAX, but then we cut to Riley and Madison going through Manila. <laughs> and to top it all off, DLC 297 doesn't even fly between LAX and New Orleans anymore. In fact, it now flies between New Orleans and Atlanta. Interesting. Yeah. 
So it's just really odd. I can't actually find any flight schedules for DL2297 that match LAX to New Orleans, but I'm led, thanks to Reality Fan Forum, to believe that that was the flight they actually took. It's just okay. weird. Odd. Mm. And then we cut into the intro, which we actually see for once, which is nice. Well, there wasn't too much to show for the showdown in the finale. <laughs> I think they could get away with the intro for this episode. That didn't stop them cutting the intro last week when they had nothing to say. And they land at 5.37pm, sunset was at 5pm, and Hung and Chi seem to be the only ones who've actually checked their bags. And if you didn't know James and Will won when they didn't check their bags in, you'd go, why didn't James and Will check their bags in? And the answer seemed to be, well, because Will didn't want to lose the ring. Ah, uh, that makes sense. That's my assumption on it. But it was in his bum bag. Yeah, I know, I know it was in his bum bag, but I'm assuming that's why they didn't check the bags, because as self-professed superfans, they should know you always check your bag if you can do. Yeah. And James says in the taxi on the way to Louis Armstrong Park that it's going to be neck and neck or leg, which is exciting. Well, not sure about that. <laughs> and Riley and Madison's driver takes them on a shortcut to Louis Armstrong Park, which, of course, is not a shortcut. It's a long cut. And something I did notice in this leg, which really hasn't been a thing, have we heard how much money they've had in any leg this season? I don't think we have. Maybe near the very beginning, but yeah, I can't recall having heard it in months now. I can't remember them telling us any money this season. Oh. And yet James has at least two $50 notes in this taxi here. I suspect they got quite a lot of money for New Orleans, and I'm not entirely sure why. Mm. I guess they want to make sure one can cross the finish line. They didn't want a, a race across the world situation. <laughs> so at Louis Armstrong Park, they find out that they have to run to Bourbon Street and then ride on a float through the parade and collect 50 red bead necklaces and 50 gold bead necklaces to get their next clue. They were huge beads. Like, I've got some from New Orleans and they, they were little beads. They are huge beads, and I was genuinely waiting for someone to get clocked in the head with them. <laughs> they look like they could hurt if they hit you. Hung just topples mm. over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Falls off the float. And Riley and Madison leave their cab and start running, which is always a good idea. Will says he's ridden on a Mardi Gras float before. And then Hung and Chi arrive second. And then Will flashes the crowds, and we get a clip of Riley saying, This is brutal, which is 100% a Franken an edit, and it cuts straight to break before they find the park straight afterwards. And it's Hung and Chi who are the first to ask the Grand Marshal if their beads are correct, but they have some skinny ones, so get a rejection. And then James notices that the Grand Marshal's wearing big beads, and they leave in first. But not before Riley and Madison also flash the crowds. And then it is a roadblock, which is who'll be left holding the baby. And in this roadblock, one team member must search through piles of king cakes to find a doll in one of them. Once they've completed that, they have to eat half a dozen beignets with their partner to get their next clue. But on the way to Café Beignet, they also have to play washboards and join a band. Have fun with it. And did you notice who out of Riley and Madison did the roadblock? Mm, no. Neither did the editors, really, because it was Madison who did it, but he seemed to be wearing Riley's chef coat, because they were all monogram chef coats. Really? Yes. So you have the caption on the screen saying Madison, you have him wearing the Riley jacket, even though it 100% is Madison, because finally after this leg I can tell the difference between them. But, you know, they said that the person who, that it had to be the teammate who didn't do the last one, so they got it wrong, production got it wrong. Yeah, someone somewhere gave Madison the wrong jacket, and it just became quite visible during the leg. And it is Will, Chi, and Madison, or is it Riley, doing this roadblock? And then Hung and Chi leave in second, and their entire logic on who should do the roadblock is Chi saying, it sounds heavy, so I'll do it. How big is this baby? Is it Paul Bunyan? <laughs> and Will pushes through the cakes to try and find the baby, and then the staff of the cafe wheel out two more cake racks. And then Riley and Madison leave the beads in last. Will finds the baby first, he struggles to get the beignet down, and the best part is that at one point he's gagging right next to Riley and Madison's rack. <laughs> and then 
they leave in first, and James says goodbye to the cafe people by saying, thank you so much, that was delicious. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, we did just see ten minutes of Will gagging on Banyer. <laughs> I've um I searched up in Sydney where can I get one of those because I want to try them. Never had one. There is a um a recipe for them. I I googled it to make sure they were actually pronouncing Banyer right, and they were. Of course, you would check that up. <laughs> oh my god, I'm not going to cook one. I'd like to just buy one to eat. Oh my god, and I need to tell you that the you know those little babies they're so small. When when I was pregnant and I was telling my I was going to tell my parents that um, and also my sister was going to tell at the same time that we were pregnant, um, we gave my dad just two of those babies at lunch. We just put them in front of his plate. <laughs> we had to work out what they meant, but they're so small. So your sister was pregnant at the same time you were. Yes, that's interesting. No, she was. She's five. She was five months further on than I was but so she'd already told dad but we handed him two babies just to confuse him that's all. So it seems must now travel by taxi to the New Orleans Convention Centre and then find the next clue near Hall H. Hung sees Cheese Baby on the table edge but obviously as this is a roadblock in a season of people not helping each other you can't help your partner in a roadblock and once James and Will get there they realise that it is another roadblock which is who wants to take a swing at this roadblock. And in this roadblock, the team member who didn't complete the last one must climb under the Crescent City Connection Bridge and swing out over the mighty Mississippi River to get their next clue. To get there, they'll need to go in marked vehicles, which appear to be police escorts, because there were flashing blue and red lights on the front of those cars. Really? What time of the day were they there? Well, they landed at 5.37, so it's probably 9, 10 o'clock at night. Okay. They seem to have closed the entire bridge for this. And it is James, Hung, and Riley or Madison doing this roadblock. And then Chi finally spots the baby, and they leave in second. Have either of you guys done anything like this bridge swing? No. No. That's just falling off a perfectly stable thing. It's It's not really... Oh, well, they'd only have swings like that sort of stuff really... Where do they have it in, like, in Africa? I have. <laughs> Why? I did something very similar to this earlier in the year, because basically because of the whole pandemic thing, I went down to four days at work a week, as did everyone else in basically the entire company I worked for. And I only had about six weeks of this because of the fact that, obviously, it being me, I'm irreplaceable, so they needed me back quickly. But <laughs> the one... <laughs> <laughs> the one time I actually did something on my day off, I went to like a high wires obstacle course thing, probably 20 miles away. And yeah. they have what they call the, the Tarzan swing there, which is basically jump off a platform across an abyss into a big cargo net. And it was terrifying. God, yeah, it looks terrifying. I have the utmost sympathy for James for having to do that because it was genuinely terrifying. It was only somewhere in the region of about 13 metres up when I did it, as opposed to 51 on this bridge, because I did look that up. I thought Hung would have been screaming a lot more than what she did. No, but if you remember, Hung wasn't screaming because of the heights. Hung was screaming because she couldn't keep her feet on the building. That's something that is actually oh, quite misleading in this episode okay. that they go back to, is the fact that Hung was never screaming because she was scared. She obviously wasn't particularly happy about doing a heights challenge, but she wasn't screaming because... She was scared. She was screaming because she couldn't keep her feet on the building because she was too short. Mm. So once teams complete that challenge, they have to abseil down the bridge together and then push a hundred foot inflatable ball to Mardi Gras world where they will find their next clue. And Hunger G's taxi driver seems to know that they are on the amazing race and tells them about his friend who is also driving another team. And I'm under the impression that usually they don't even confirm that they're on Amazing Race. They claim they're filming a documentary series or something, even in America. I guess after 32 seasons, it's it's pretty easy to figure it out. It's easy to figure it out, but they never usually confirm it, and they certainly don't keep that in the episode. Mm, it's, it's very strange. I mean, they, they say it's a travel show. That's what they said when they were in Sydney. And I'm like, you're right. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> The usual excuse they use is travel documentary, I believe. 
Well, they like to, ever since they had those live starts, they like to have as much of a social media presence as possible and generate as much buzz. They do, but I think after what happened in uh, in Detroit, they don't necessarily want the same buzz. They had quite a few issues in Detroit for the uh, the finale earlier in the year when they filmed this, if you remember. Oh, the winner being revealed? <laughs> well, yeah, including the fact that basically the the winner was revealed, the final three were definitely revealed in the order in which they left the uh, the final task. But also, the city council, um, the city council stopped them doing their final task in a certain location. I think as well, they had a hell of a time. What do you mean? What was wrong with the where the final task was originally? In thirty one, they were going to do it on an island, and the uh, the city council put a stop to it because they were going to do it on an island to stop everyone spoiling it, and it obviously didn't work because they ended up having to do it in a much more public place, and everyone saw exactly what happened. Mm. So Hung and Chi finally mentioned their Amazing Race fandom for the first time since the Travelocity Roaming Gnome clip, and Hung mentions that she doesn't particularly like heights. They show the Berlin roadblock, as I mentioned, or is it a detour, which is a little bit misleading. And I also love how Chi is still wearing the chef's jacket because he obviously wanted a souvenir from the season. He wears it through the entire leg because he obviously wanted to keep it. Yeah, they're not going to pry it off of him, I guess. You're not going to see Phil tackle him at the 50-yard line and rip off the, the costume from him. We need to save this for the next time we do a similar task. Do you know how much our budget has been cut? Hmm. And Riley and Madison finally leave the first roadblock in last. And then teams have to search the warehouse for a chest containing 30 puzzle pieces, which they have to attach to their ball to create a map of the world to get their final clue. James and Will put out all their pieces on the floor, they map it out entirely and have basically no trouble, they get a no from the Mardi Gras world owner, and they leave on their second attempt. And then teams must now find the New Orleans Superdome, or as I called it on last week's podcast accidentally, the New Orleans Thunderdome. The finish line for the season of the race, the first team to check in will win the amazing race and $1 million. And there is a deeply unsubtle clue, in the same style as Amazing Race 16, of find the place where the Saints go marching in. They love their football stadiums on Amazing Race. They do because it's not necessarily a public location. They like to have somewhere where they can control who can go in and out. Mm. Arguably, obviously, anywhere where it's a massively public location, RFF are going to have people who are standing there and seeing who's actually going to go in in first and then not report it. It's too bad that Gary D'Anfield missed out on this being the finish line. Because they can say, well, that's not a very new place for us to visit. The finish line, we're going to come here to practice in a couple weeks. And we don't even see anyone in the same frame. James and Will win the race. However, we do get the highlight of the entire episode, which is, of course, D'Angelo smiling through the pain. I know. (laughs) I was like, why is he smiling so much? You can definitely tell that when they were pre-recording all the teams clapping and stuff, as they always do at the finish line, D'Angelo was like, I'm not going to clap. I don't give a shit. I am not clapping for these horrible people. <laughs> and they, they just managed to somehow convince him to do one kind of evil smile to the camera, and that's what they cut to with him. We'll edit it in post. And James gets his speech about being a super fan and applying so much, which you can't fault him for at all, as I said in the preview. As much as I obviously hate people saying that getting on The Amazing Race is their biggest uh, biggest accomplishment in life, for James, I actually do genuinely believe it. Yeah, he's we're yeah. Well, I, I discovered we're actually like there's this one group for people who've been playing online reality games for a really long time. Like people who originally started playing over 15 years ago, and I just recently found out that James is in the same group. I'm not so, at all surprised. Yeah, mm. so it's a group where I'm like, it was all people who I originally played with at least 15 years ago, so like 2005 or earlier, and then it just said, oh, James. James is in this group too. I'm thinking, hmm, yeah, that does not surprise me. So there's people that we've probably both, we may have even both known the same people for over 15 years. And Leo says that he's not even bitter at the team who tried to U-turn them out of the race. And then a mystery, let's be honest, 11 weeks in the making, gets solved when Will proposes. Now, are they the first winning team to propose at the finish line, Logan? The first winning team? Let's see. I'm trying to think. Wasn't Tyler and Laura, I know that. <laughs> it wasn't Brooke and Scott. <laughs> 
Tyler and Laura got a selfie with uh, Phil at the finish line instead. <laughs> they are the, aren't they are the first winning team. They are. I'm, I'm just teasing you. Yeah. They're the first winning team in the US, at least. I just wanted to kind of trick you, I'll be honest. Oh, jeez. And we finally see Riley or Madison jump off the bridge. And I have to say, <laughs> this task on any other season probably would have been a lot more entertaining. Just imagine the sort of people we could have seen jump off this bridge. Flo? Yeah, Flo, Flo would have been a great choice. I was more thinking of maybe Rachel Riley doing it. Jeez. Oh, but I suppose she is a bit too busy being a Golden Girl, Silver Nemesis, Bronzer, Sourdough Starter, Unprecedented <laughs> Timer, Monopoly Food Banker, Tanuki Suit Tailor, Pornography Historian, America's Next Flop Model, Grog Hawk, <laughs> fuck's sake, Bindles, <laughs> Fedora, Fedora. You got something wrong there. Bindles sent me these a few days ago and I immediately copied them to my notes and put them in white text so I wouldn't read them beforehand. So I am genuinely reading these as I'm saying them. It's a Ron Burgundy situation. <laughs> America's Next Flop Model, Grog Hog, Fedora Adora, Balloon Animal Wrangler, Reindeer Walker, Television's Alf, Galactic Viceroy of Potential Excellence, Inventor of the Pay-Per-View Dessert Recipe Site, Only Flans, and Employment Consultant. Oh my god. I have to say, of all the Rachel Riley job lists I've read, Inventor of the Pay-Per-View Dessert Recipe Site, Only Flans, is by far <laughs> the best Bindles has ever written. <laughs> We've got to have all the classics. Uh, Hung and she get a rejection at the final task. When they push the globe off the float, half of their pieces fall off, but they get an acceptance on the second attempt, and then checking in second, and they finally had a honeymoon. And then Riley and Madison bring up the rear in third. They look pissed. Yeah, they do, actually. And I have to say, as they said earlier in the season, they've not won anything since 2017. Why are they still upset? Get over it. I think that wasn't 2007. Does it matter, really? They were in quite young in 2007. Yeah. Did you see the pictures of them without beards a few days ago, by the way? No. I just saw Gary with a huge beard. I'm like, Gary, get rid of that thing. Yeah, Gary looks homeless at the moment. (sighs) Gary looks like an ex-professional athlete who didn't manage their money properly. As much as I obviously love Gary, I think he said on Race's Recap that he's growing it until the end of the pandemic, which he's going to have a very long beard. Oh my god. He needs to shave. He looks a lot better shaven. Or groom or something. I don't know how you guys groom beards, but it looks like it needs help. <laughs> I don't know. It needs an intervention? Yes, it needs something. <laughs> he just needs a beard intervention. That's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Which one's which? <laughs> I think it's Riley on the left, Madison on the right, but don't quote me on that. Wow, why have they got beards? And of course, Phil ends the season by mentioning that they have just rolled over one million miles. 18 days ago. (laughs) I guess you want to wait till they're all together to announce that. Yeah, but you mentioned it at the start as well, and it's still as inaccurate as it was at the start line. As we mentioned, they crossed the one million mile mark somewhere in leg two or three. It's literally two and a half weeks ago at this point, and irrelevant. But also, as you all know, Logan, um, the Amazing Race Twitter did post a video to celebrate one million miles earlier in the week with the caption, six continents, 32 seasons, 92 countries, 316 teams, and one million miles raced. And as with pretty much everything to do with Amazing Race now, not entirely accurate. They determined the 316 teams thing in such a weird way. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, because how many teams have there actually been on Amazing Race? I believe we calculated 355. 355 is correct if you include all the teams that have returned. If you take all those out, it goes down to 319, because you 100% cannot exclude any of the merged teams. You can't exclude Eric and Danielle, because they won. You cannot exclude Mark and Mallory as much as I would love to scrub that from my memory. You can't exclude them. And you certainly cannot exclude Rachel and Elitha, given Elitha has never been on another team. Essentially, she's been erased from history. Yeah. A better metric would have been actually calculating how many races there have been, and I would Mm. have accepted that, rather than saying 316 teams. I would have accepted the 
653, I think it is, races, then it would have been acceptable. But saying 316 teams just excludes the three special teams that we've had in Amazing Race and is therefore wrong. It was you who wrote that whole post somewhere, wasn't it? Um, Counting down and adding and subtracting. Was it you that wrote all that? Probably. It does sound like the sort of thing I would do. Yeah, it was, yeah. I thought, okay, this is this is very well calculated. <laughs> I know for a fact that I worked out in chat to Manib when I was chatting to him earlier in the week because you cannot say 316 teams at all. It just doesn't work. Well, it was 319, was it? Yeah, 319 is acceptable. I would have also accepted 653 races. You cannot accept anything else if you're talking about the US only. It's not far off. Yeah, but not far off is as good as wrong. Oh, jeez. Jeez. It's exactly the same as saying that Tara and Will were not far off winning and therefore should have won the million dollars. They still lost, therefore it's wrong. You need to talk to this person, obviously. I really wish that the Amazing Race Twitter would actually, you know, not ignore me, because I know things when they don't. <laughs> but talking of Amazing Race Twitter not ignoring me... Let's be honest, it's the same social media team as Survivor and Big Brother now. They posted a stupid thing about, these are all exciting comps, and compared Big Brother comics, uh, recurring veto competition, to a fire-making challenge in Survivor. And then, of course, the Amazing Race classic, which was Scaling a Wall. And I replied to them saying, because Scaling a Wall is the first challenge you think of when you think both Amazing and Amazing Race. And for some reason, they liked this, even though I was, as always, taking the piss out of them. Um, the video that everyone had to post in, if you're an American citizen, they did that for Survivor as well. What did they do with them? When they did that for Survivor, did they actually have a montage? No. Why did they ask people to do it? Because they want attention. But why bother? Why? I don't. I don't understand. If you're not actually going to make a little commercial with, say, um, I don't know, 10 people and then saying, you know, Amazing Race tonight at six or something. Why, why, why get people to send in stuff? Michelle, why bother is pretty much the production attitude this season. They have, spoilers, really, really shit the bed on this one. But Survivor did it too and they didn't do anything. Yeah, no, but the thing is, it's all the same social media team. Yeah. There is no distinction now between the Survivor team, the Big Brother team, and the Amazing Race team, because they're cost-cut. And obviously the person in charge of the Amazing Race one has never seen Amazing Race before. Or used Twitter before, because we actually had today, we're recording this on Saturday, we actually had today an instance where the Amazing Race Twitter actually posted something starting with the word Twitter, probably about <laughs> two hours ago. Because oh they'd obviously God. copied and pasted it wrong, and it made me howl. Is it still there now? Yep. I replied I to it. find it. Oh, my God. Oh, no, they've deleted it now. What? They've deleted it. Really? What horrible people. Well, what did you reply? <laughs> what did you say? I, I've got the screenshot somewhere. Uh, let me just find it. Was it the Ryan thing? That was only an hour ago. No, it must have been a James and Will post. Anything is possible. No, it's a different one to that. Oh. So they posted, and I quote, Twitter, this week one team became season 32 champions and secured the $1 million prize. Crying smiley. In case you missed it, watch the exciting hashtag Amazing Race finale now. And what did you write? So I replied, Twitter, it was two years ago. <laughs> oh, God. They've obviously not reposted it yet. Oh, it's funny. So, just a few stats. Uh, Riley and Madison now have the highest third place average in the US seasons, and they are seventh in the US only rankings, and they are third best for third places worldwide. Much to, I'm sure, their amusement, James and Will's average is now better than Jet and Cord's, which I'm sure Jet and Cord will love. <laughs> They're directly next to each other, by the way. James and Will are on 2.55, um, and Jet and Cord are on 2.57, I think. What's funny is that. Uh... James and Will may or may not have broken uh, Dan and Jordan's record for the longest of margin vic uh, victory in a finale. Yeah, it wasn't close. We don't obviously know how close it was, but it was not close. 
Yeah, because I think the Uchen and Joyce and Dan and Jordan have both won their respective seasons by... I think both of them have been said that it's like 45 minutes, 45 minute victory. And I mean, we don't see James and Will in the same shot with another team after the cafe. And yeah, yeah, after the cafe task, when they were already a full task ahead of the other, like the other two teams hadn't even moved on to the eating portion yet. So that tells me it's, it could have been, a, it could have been a record. I mean, it's crazy when you think that we had a finale where, the only time they design suspense over who crosses the finish line is to find out who crosses the finish line second. Average placement is 4.27 worldwide. Only three teams in this season, which was the final three, bettered it. Only three teams beat the worldwide average in this entire season out of 11. Only those three also beat the season average of 4.44 and the US average of 4.31. And given how long this layoff was... In having to wait to get their prize money, James and Will have lost about $35,000 due to inflation. Ouch. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> so actually, in 2018 terms, they are winning about about $965,000. Ouch. So, have you guys got any quick thoughts before we, we wrap this up? This wasn't, people think this was the worst structured finale ever. It wasn't the greatest structure to a finale, but it's definitely not the worst one. It was still better than 24s. Yeah, that's not a high bar though, is it? It just happens that one team was able to just get a massive lead. (laughs) I don't have anything else to say. No, I was just that I'm very happy with the winners. Um, That... I wish you hadn't been so, I don't know, pissed off all season. (laughs) However, we still podcasted, so I'm happy. Do you disagree that the editing was terrible this season? Um, I don't get as angry about it as you do. Yeah, but that wasn't the question. Um, (laughs) The question was, was the edit terrible? The answer is yes. Well, I I don't think it was terrible. Because we have different uh, extremes, I suppose. Um, I'll amend it slightly then. Do you think that the editors told a coherent story this season? (laughs) The edit was, yes, it was a bit off. It wasn't normal like other seasons, correct? Just like in our podcast show notes, the answer is usually no if I ask these sort of questions. (laughs) I didn't say no. The next question, I think, is one that has been holding over the season like the Sword of Damocles since actually before we even thought Amazing Race 32 was going to come back. And I'll I'll ask you individually on this one. Michelle, if Amazing Race 33 was back next month, would you return? Of course. Of course I would. I love the Amazing Race. I'll talk about it till the cows come home. I don't care. I, I, you know what? I'm not. I'm not. Um, I will. I will talk about it no matter what it looks or sounds or whatever it's like. You, I, I understand you have values. <laughs> I think Michelle probably knows exactly why I'm asking her this question first. Logan, what would you say if uh, Amazing Race 33 came back next month? Would you cover it? Uh, if there's at least three new countries added, then yes. Woohoo! <laughs> Stop changing your mind. This is meant to be a gang up on Michelle. Ha 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 ha. But I mean, I said at least three new countries. If they don't have three new countries, then. Yeah, but, no. yeah, but you, as, as you well know, that's not happening. Unsurprisingly, my answer is no. And as a result, I will not be covering Amazing Race anymore. This season probably shouldn't have happened in terms of recaps. This season only happened on my part because I wanted to do it for Michelle. Being honest. Thanks. I wouldn't have done it if Michelle wasn't there because I did it as kind of a a treat for Michelle because I knew you would have got really pissed off at me if I'd said no. (laughs) I could sugarcoat it, but you would have been really, really fucked off with me if I'd said no. Oh, yeah. But... This cast deserved a far better season than they got. I've made no secret of the fact that I think production have been asleep at the wheel for quite a while, but never has it been more evident than this season. They've 
in spite of a brilliant cast, and it's by far the best cast since since 29. There's no question about that in my mind. In spite of a brilliant cast, every opportunity they have shat the bed. And frankly, I'm not entirely confident I'll be watching 33. I certainly won't be covering it. I think you'll watch it. I think you won't be able to help yourself. I didn't with uh, Amazing Race Canada. Amazing Race Canada, I said I'm not covering it, and then I've still not watched the past two seasons. I know, I know but they're only in Canada, so you sort of got an excuse. Mind you, the Australian one does look very good, even though we're only in Australia. And mm. But Australia is very diverse continent. But I cannot, hand on heart, agree to watch a show with such a shit as a host. Bo is awful. I know, but he's only on right at the end. Don't don't worry about him. As both a host and, more importantly, a human being, Bo is a conniving little shit. Yeah. He's only on right at the end. Don't worry about him. Yeah, but that doesn't matter. And also, there are strong rumours in this upcoming Australian season that it's going to be multi-episode legs, number one. And I've heard rumours of 17 legs as it is. I know. They did They did a lot of stuff. It, it can't be normal length. Which means it's going to be so glacially paced. Oh, it's going to be like when they did their mole Australia reboot thing. Yeah. Because for all my love of Australian Survivor, they tend to get the casting right and not meddle too much. I don't think they're going to get anything right with Amazing Race Australia 5. And frankly, it seems though it's going to go up against the Australian Open in February, it's going to get absolutely crushed and not come back for Season 6. I don't think it'll get crushed. They're actually starting the Open when Amazing Race will start. I think it's the same week. Apparently they were supposed to start it three weeks earlier, but I don't know why they're not doing it, the, um, the Open. But... I think because at the beginning you don't have a lot of the big stars, you know, it's on and it's just all the little people. I think more people will watch Amazing Race. I think you have far more faith in the Australian public than I would because I've seen the ratings for last season. Last season got absolutely crushed by anything it was put up against and it's pretty much only back because they have nothing better to show and because it's very cheap television for ten to make. I think it'll do better than last year because there's nothing else on. If it doesn't do better than last year, it it really needs to get cancelled. There were a few episodes that were sub Mole Australia 6 when that got cancelled. And that is a low bar. 17 legs and multi-episode legs. So th- There is a rumour of uh, of 17 legs, I believe. So that'd be like, at least, they're probably doing at least 20 episodes then? Probably do two, ep- they're going to do the, uh, are they do essentially doing the Australian Survivor format where it's two episodes a week for 10 weeks? I think, or? yeah, I think they'll do that. It might be 26 episodes like Australian Survivors, in which case, ooh, 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 it's going to be boring. I don't think it would be 26. That would be insane. If it's 17 likes, 26 is plausible, Michelle. <laughs> I think it would just be two a week. It can't possibly be three a week. 17 likes, that'd be a record, right? No version's done more than 13. No one, no one's even gone above the traditional 13. Hamrots didn't even pull off a 14-episode season? or No, Hamrots had two seasons with 14 teams, but both of those started with two half legs, where it was seven teams doing each, and one team got eliminated at the end of each. They've never had more than 13 legs on Hamrots. And it's all domestic. Yeah, four, <laughs> 14 teams in a leg is a record, no matter what. Yeah, and then if it's 17 legs, that crushes the leg record. Although, I have heard a rumour of a start line elimination. No! I've heard there is one, but it's unconfirmed. Uh... Maybe it'll count as one of the legs. Put it this way, Michelle, there's one team who have appeared in a trailer who Reality Fan Forum knew nothing about and haven't seen since. Jesus. That is the worst thing ever. Why would you do that to somebody? So immediately, it's going to be up against the Australian Open anyway, so it's going to get Christian ratings. Then they're going to start eliminating teams randomly. It's basically going to be a Mole Australia 6 situation where you don't know where the next elimination's coming. It's going to be an utter shit show. Anyway, going back to what I was saying about us not returning, the one thing I will say is that we're not necessarily done with Amazing Race this year because there's one more episode coming because next week we are going to seen as though we did this for Amazing Race Canada and 
me and Logan were talking earlier this week that I don't think it's it's wise to try and compress all our feelings about Amazing Race going bye bye into this episode. We are going to do a Amazing Race is supposed to be good and fun episode for the US and give it the Viking funeral it deserves next week. One final thing for this episode for me is the fact that as a result of that episode, I am going to bring back one thing that I know people absolutely love when we do. I've been promising it all season. We're going to have a face cream clip next week. However, I would quite like to see if anyone wants to suggest some face cream clips from the years that they want to hear in this final montage. So if anyone does have any face cream requests, and I can't believe I'm actually asking this, if anyone has any face cream requests, then um, hit us up on Twitter before, like, maybe Wednesday, and I will see what I can put in. Radio. Have you guys got anything else you want to say before we conclude this episode? Uh, no. Nope. Good. All I will say is I hope everyone has a wonderful Christmas as much as you can. We are recording this on the day when parts of the UK, and I'm not sure if your brother's affected with this, Michelle, are going into utter lockdown again for Christmas. Yes, I think he is. I can't remember whether whether it actually affects your brother or not, because my, my granddad lives about 10 miles away from your, where your brother lives, and he's not oh. affected, thankfully. Well, my brother-in-law is infected here in Sydney because where he lives on the northern beaches, they, um, they've gone into total lockdown till Wednesday night. So, yes, well, I, we're obviously thinking you're not coming to Christmas right now because <laughs> you're just in the leprosy zone. Um, yeah, so it may be a, a smaller group for Christmas if we do it at all. So I hope everyone has a wonderful end of the year as much as they can, obviously. Hopefully 2021 will be better. This was meant to be our last live episode of the year, but it's not now. So we will be back next Sunday for the final time in Amazing Race Recapping. So, thank you for listening to our Amazing Race 32 recaps this season. We will be back next week to give Amazing Race the Viking funeral it deserves before actually signing off for the year. Don't forget you can contact us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram where we are, RTV Warriors. Or you can email us and contact us at rtvwarriors.com. Logan is on Twitter at logsupergwacky. Michelle is better. And I'm MJ Harmstone. Logan and I will also be back to conclude Belgium or South Africa with the finale and reunion episodes on Thursday. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye. Peace out and just chill till the final episode.